My name is Madeline Ildefonso, and I'm a librarian from the Office of Civics and Community Services at the Los Angeles Public Library. I'm here to welcome you to today's Big Read program with our special guests from the International Rescue Committee, Jonathan Fain Peraño and Kimberly Protzel. We recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders, past and present, and the descendants, descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside in, check out native-land.ca. We would also like to recognize the ongoing refugee crisis. And for more information, check out rescue.org backslash topic backslash refugee crisis. We'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Arts Big Read, a partnership with the Arts Midwest, the Department of Cultural Affairs, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Lenore S. and Bernard A. Greenberg Fund, the Library Foundation, and the behind the scenes staff for helping to bring this program to you virtually. In addition, we would like to thank the friends of the Chinatown Library for supporting our Big Read program series. If you would like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org events. Our website also has blog posts and video links that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. Participants in today's program will have the chance to win a free copy of The Best We Could Do. Email bigread at lapl.org to receive the link to the survey to be entered into the opportunity drawing to win a free copy of The Best We Could Do. You can also scan the QR code on the screen to access the survey. If during the program you find you're having a difficult time, please contact the LA County Emotional Support Form line here at 800-854-7771, available 10.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. daily. And now on today's program, I'm welcoming to the virtual stage, Jonathan Fain Preano and Kimberly Protzel. Thank you very much, Maddie. Um, thank you, Los Angeles Public Library, again, for having us today. Um, I'll let actually Kim introduce herself first, and then I'll go next. Kim? All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Kimberly Protzel. I'm a senior legal representative at International Rescue Committee in Los Angeles, and I'm uh, very happy to speak with all of you guys today about uh, citizenship and naturalization. Awesome. Thank you, Kim. And again, my name is Jonathan Fainbrano. I'm the integration manager for the IRC office here in Los Angeles, overseeing uh, economic empowerment, education, uh, advocacy, job readiness training. And I work with Kim in the immigration program, along with our colleagues there and assisting all Angelinos with their immigration needs. So we're happy to be here. We're happy to uh, have this Friday afternoon with you to share some of the information on naturalization. So we're going to go ahead and, sh and share our screen. And Kim and I will go over the process of the naturalization information and what, what you need to do, the process, and then we'll also have some time for generic questions. Um, and here's our caveat to this before we, we go any further. This is not legal advice, what we're providing. We are providing you information on how the naturalization process works, and we will not be uh, conducting specific case-specific answers to any questions that may come up, but we'll give you the information on how you can set up a one-on-one -on -one private appointment with a Department of Justice accredited representative or immigration attorney who will be able to assist you with a more specific answer to your question. Yeah, so remember that, this is a public forum, so definitely don't be putting in your private information about your immigration case, uh, but we'll be giving you information so that you can uh, reach out and uh, be able to get a consultation from an accredited representative or an attorney. Awesome. So here's just an overview of what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about what naturalization is, and hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, we're going to talk about advantages and disadvantages of naturalization. We're going to, going to talk about the naturalization process itself, and also talk about how to avoid scams and find quality, safe, affordable assistance with, uh, with your immigration case. So I'll start with the simple uh, question and answer, what is naturalization? A naturalization is the process by which an eligible lawful permanent resident or green card holder obtain, applies and obtains U.S. citizenship. So people call it the citizenship process. Some people call it the citizenship application. Naturalization is just the more technical term that we use for this process. So with naturalization, there are going to be tons of advantages and disadvantages. Well, we do like to discuss some of the advantages to begin with, 
obviously voting in local, state, and national elections is a huge advantage of becoming a U.S. citizen. So is be, uh, obtaining a U.S. passport. Uh, you'll be able to apply for more family members to come to the United States through a family petition, usually with a shorter processing times, but we'll go into a little more detail in just a minute. In some cases, you may be able to transfer that citizenship to children that were born abroad, and uh, as well as the fact that with U.S. citizenship, it's the best security against deportation. Once you have it, in very rare instances, is it going to be taken away um, you'll be a U.S. citizen. I mentioned family petitions. As a U.S. citizen, you are eligible to apply for a greater variety of, uh, of family members. You can see for lawful permanent residents, it's down to about three categories, spouses, unmarried children over 21, and unmarried children under 21. But for U.S. citizens, there are more categories. You can see that uh, you can now apply for your parents or for married children, or even your siblings. And you can see the highlight right here, so you can see that difference. Other advantages include that you would be eligible to serve as a juror in the courts, um, thus informing our legal system. You'll be uh, entitled to public benefits for uh, longer periods of time, and that includes things like SSI, where you wouldn't be limited to the seven-year time limitation that is usually applied to lawful permanent residents. Additionally, uh, you can receive U.S. government assistance and protection while you're abroad. So what that means is, let's say there's a global pandemic like now, and you need to return home urgently, you could go to a U.S. Uh, consulate in another country with your U.S. passport and say, hey, I need your assistance. I need to get out of here. Uh, and the U.S. government will be able to provide assistance and protection if you need it. More advantages, because there are so many. Uh, you'll be able to live in another country for as long as you want without losing your U.S. citizenship. Uh, as a lawful permanent resident, if you spend periods exceeding one year, you may uh, lose your green card for not residing in the United States. But with, a, uh, with U.S. citizenship, you can retire in another country if that's what you wanted to do. You'll also be eligible for uh, government jobs and holding public office. So say you wanted to become a, a postal worker, you'll be able to do so as a U.S. citizen. Additionally, U.S. citizenship is like a diamond. It doesn't expire. You don't have to renew it every 10 years like you would with a permanent residency. You go through this process once, you pass it, and that's it you are a U.S. citizen for the rest of your time. And lastly, you are not required to report a change of address each time that you move as a U.S. citizen. As lawful permanent residents and most other immigrants, uh, that is a requirement to report a change of address with the U.S. government, but not, not as a U.S. citizen. So where there are advantages, there's always going to be some disadvantages. So let's talk a little bit about that. One thing to keep in mind is when you become a U.S. citizen, you might lose the citizenship of your native country. And that's uh, what happens when there are uh, when that country does not accept dual citizenship. The good news is that many countries do allow it. For example, uh, Mexico and the U.S., they allow dual citizenship, and therefore you could be a U.S. citizen and a Mexican citizen at the same time. In some cases, if you have a petition pending for a child as a lawful permanent resident, becoming a U.S. citizen may negatively affect the wait time, meaning it might take longer for that family petition to go through. But we're talking about an extended period of months. We're not talking about five years of an increased wait time. But it is something to keep in mind. And for anyone who is a princess, a duke, um, if you have an order of nobility in your native country, I'm sorry, but you'll have to give that up when becoming a U.S. citizen. If you are planning on owning a property in a different country, uh, keep in mind that some countries do not allow foreign ownership of property, meaning if you lose your citizenship of your native country and, you, and they don't allow U.S. citizens to own property, then uh, you may not be 
able to own property in that country. And the last disadvantage, the one that I always say it's not 100% true, <clears throat> is that naturalization can be an intimidating uh, process for some people. It's a scary thing. It's so many forms. It's so much work. I say it's not the biggest uh, disadvantage because we're here to help. We have resources available. We have representatives uh, available to help anyone who wants to become a U.S. citizen if they are eligible for that. There are also classes available if uh, your worries are about the interview and the exam. And we'll go into more detail about that in just a little bit. Thank you, Kim. And, and that's part of the naturalization process. It's not something you have to do alone. There are organizations like IRC and other partner organizations through the public Los Angeles Public Library that can assist you in not only completing these these uh, the paperwork that I'm going to talk about in the process, but also learning how to get ready for that class. So I'm going to talk about the naturalization process, and we're going to go over eligibility requirements. And these are general eligibility requirements. Some may change uh, depending on on how you obtain your green card and other circumstances. We're going to talk about the, the application process what you have to do in preparation for your interview, what you have to do for your interview and during your interview, and what happens after the interview and once you have a successful interview and a test, once you get to your oath ceremony. So eligibility requirements. We'll start the, with the most basic general one and it's be a, a lawful permanent resident, LPR or green card holder, and have been one for either five years, three years if, you, if married to a US citizen, or there are exceptions for service in the US Armed Forces in terms of how long you have to wait. You must be at least 18 years of age at the time of applying for US citizenship. You must be able to demonstrate that you can speak, read, and write basic English, and you must pass the famous US history and government test, or what they call the civics test. You must also maintain continuous US residency, live in your district for at least three months, maintain physical presence in the United States, have good moral character, and of course, be willing to take the oath of allegiance to the United States during your oath ceremony. So here's a few no a note on eligibility, and a lot of you might be asking this question. There are exceptions to the English test, all right? So if you are 50 years of age and have been a resident for at least 20 years, and resident meaning having a green card, or you are 55 years of age and have been a resident for 15 years, you're not required to take the English test for the, for the interview, and you may take the history and civics test in your native language. That also means that your interview portion of, of, the, of the interview process may be done in your native language if the officer speaks your language, or you may bring an interpreter with you for that part. The forms involved for the application process are the main one, the N-400, the application for naturalization, but there's a few additional forms that you may file if, if you're getting assistance or if you qualify for, a, for another type of exemption. The G-28 is if you file your application with an attorney or a Department of Justice recognized agency such as IRC, which were authorized by the Department of Justice in the practice and assistance with immigration law and immigration cases. Another form that may be involved in your application process may be the N-648 or Medical Certification for Disability Exception, which may be submitted by applicants seeking exemption from taking the English and or civics exam due to a physical and or mental disability that affects their ability to learn or demonstrate knowledge. And this is a form that's always filled out by a medical professional, and it's not a form that's filled out by, a, by an attorney or a Department of Justice accredited representative. It's important to note that all these forms need to be filed concurrently at the time of the application. They all have to be filed at the same time. The part that everybody worries about is the cost of it. So the USCIS application fee, the government fee at this time is $725, and that includes your biometrics fee, or what the, the fingerprint, what people call the fingerprint appointment. Um, however, if you are unable to pay the 725 and you are eligible for the I-912, the request for a fee waiver, IRC and other organizations may be able to assist you in identifying if you're eligible for said waiver. And it can be done through either 
the, the receipt of public benefits or based on your income and your tax return. There's also financial hardship as the third eligibility category for the fee waiver. So I just mentioned that the, uh, the three ways to qualify for the fee waiver is based on your means tested benefit, food stamps, Medi-Cal SSI. If your annual income is below 150% of the poverty line for the size of your household, or if you can demonstrate significant financial difficulties or financial hardship. And again, this is something that your immigration attorney or Department of Justice accredited representative can do with you to identify which, which one you qualify for. So moving on to the application process and what documents you'll need and to include with your application, uh, we'll definitely need to include certain pieces of proof, starting with proof of your lawful permanent resident status. Usually that will mean at the front and the back of your green card. We'll usually include as well a copy of the social security card, your current uh, driver's license or state ID. And if you have a passport, we like to include the first page of your passport in your application packet. So what happens after your application gets submitted? Well, the first thing that you'll receive from USCIS is a receipt notice. This, con this confirms that they have received your application and that uh, the fee waiver was approved if you submitted a fee waiver with your application. From there, you'll be given a fingerprint notice or a biometrics appointment with USCIS, and they'll provide you with the date and the time and the location where you, where you would need to appear. Now, currently with uh, social distancing and just current uh, programs with uh, USCIS, some people may receive a notice saying that they will reuse old fingerprints uh, from previous uh, immigration processes. Uh, if that's the case, you will not have to go to USCIS. They will simply use your old fingerprint information. If additional documentation is needed, USCIS will let you know by mail. Uh, they may request, uh, for example, certificates of disposition or maybe some uh, information about um, a marriage license or divorce uh, decree, things of that nature. After that, uh, USCIS will send an interview notice. And this is the big uh, nerve wracking appointment where uh, they will go through the application and go through the, the history and civics exam and the English test. But this, uh, in this notice, you'll be given a list of documents to bring, the date, the time, and location for that interview. So what happens at the interview? Um, the interview is comprised of four, actually five different parts of uh, that you will need to get ready for. And it is important for, for me, and, and this is something that Kim and our other colleagues emphasize, you should be studying from the moment you get your green card. Uh, the more time you have to study, the less stressful this process will be. So I can emphasize that as a teacher uh, to please make sure to, if you have time to study, go ahead and study for that test because the nerves get, can get to you at, that, at, that interview, at the interview with the officer. So these are the things that happen that day. The officers will review that your naturalization application. So you fill out that form with your representative or you fill it out on your own at home and mail it in. That information that you put in there, the officer can review all that information with you. Make sure that your, na your names, your addresses, where you have lived, uh, where you're from, all the information that goes in there, the officer will go and then they can ask everything on the form or they can just ask a few things. So it's really important that you know what's in there. The speaking test is something that happens actually throughout the interview. The officer, he or she is gonna be testing your English at different stages of the interview process to make sure that you're comprehending what he or she's telling you and that your answers make sense in response to the questions given. So you're actually being tested on your English throughout the whole process. They can ask you something as simple as what time is it or how's the weather outside to something more complicated as when did you go and visit your family in Mexico in 2017? So they can ask you so many questions and they're testing your English throughout that process. Then there's the reading test where you must correctly read one of the three sentences in English provided by the officer. And they're taken from the reading vocabulary that is issued by USCIS. And this is study material that we can provide for you at the time of your uh, appointment with us to fill out your forms. Or you can also obtain it online or through one of, one of the many citizenship classes available in the city. 
For your writing test, you must correctly write one of the three sentences in English. And again, this is taken from specific vocabulary that is issued by USCIS for this process. Then the one of the final parts is the US history and government test, the famous civics exam, where you must study the 100 questions. Then the officer will ask you 10 questions at random, out of which you must answer correctly six. If you're doing your test in your native language, the officer will ask you the questions in your native language, and you can provide the answer in your native language as well. But the six out of 10 rules still applies unless you have an additional exemption there based on age and time here as a resident. So after the interview, there's three things that are gonna happen. Either uh, the USCIS officer will recommend your application for approval, they will deny your citizenship, or they'll continue the application process. If granted, great. Uh, that means the officer will uh, recommend your application for approval. You'll be scheduled for a naturalization ceremony. Sometimes it's in the same day, sometimes it's about a month later. Um, at that naturalization ceremony, you'll take the oath of allegiance, you'll return your green card, and in exchange, you'll get a certificate of naturalization. And that's when you'll officially be a US citizen. However, if uh, your application is denied, well, you'll receive a notice explaining why that application was denied. If there was a mistake on behalf of USCIS, you can request a hearing or petition for a new review of the application. Or um, if you simply want to try again, you can. You can apply again with more supporting evidence. One thing to keep in mind that if your application is denied, that doesn't mean that you lose your status. You normally will become will return to uh, being a lawful permanent resident. You will not lose your status. Everything stays the same unless uh, your application was denied because of your cr criminal history. Now, there are some deportable offenses that can come up when reviewing an application for citizenship which is why it's so important that you please let your representative know of any type of contact that you've had with, uh, with police, with immigration authorities, anything uh, negative in your history. It's better to just tell us ahead of time rather than wait until the very last minute because the last thing we want is for anyone to uh, enter into deportation proceedings. In some cases, the uh, application process will be continued Basically, it means your case will be put on hold. You'll return for a second interview. This usually happens if you failed any of the tests. Let's say you only answered five of the 10 questions correctly. You'll be given a second chance, a second interview, usually about 90 days afterwards. Or sometimes the USCIS officer simply wants to see additional documents. So they'll uh, request that you come back with whatever document they need to confirm the information you provided at your interview. So the oath ceremony, this is the final step in this long, long story, long trip that you're taking in your immigration history here in the US. And this is what all of us who do this want to see all our clients get to, to that oath ceremony when they get that naturalization certificate. So what happens? After your oath ceremony, after you get that certificate, USCIS has taken your green card and you're officially a US citizen, one of the very first things that a lot of people do is go and apply for the US passport. So you can obtain a passport application from most US post offices. Uh, the citizenship welcome packet will have an application enclosed uh, once you go through your oath ceremony, but you can also go to the State Department's website to find out of the of, of requirements in the nearest location. As a Friendly reminder for those of you who will getting who will get to that point and want to apply for the passport right away, make sure to make a copy, a photocopy of your naturalization certificate and keep that in your file, just in case something happens. You can also update your citizenship status with the Social Security Administration, and you will need to present your original certificate or of naturalization or U.S. passport to the Social Security Administration. This will just help you in your ability to access more benefits as a new U.S. citizen. And also the third most important thing that all, all our new Americans do is register to vote. Uh, a lot of you are becoming citizens because you wanna vote in that next election. 
Um, and remember, elections happen all the time, local, state, and then, of course, the federal elections. So you can register to vote. You are able to register in person or by mail at a public assistance office in your state. You can also apply at when you renew for your driver's license or apply for a new driver's license. You can also visit the U.S. Election Assistance Commission website for more information. And if you have your oath ceremony in Los Angeles, most oath ceremonies will have a voter registration table a representative outside waiting to help those new Americans register. So definitely take advantage of those oath ceremonies. And if you find them there, go ahead and do it. It's a, an amazing civic civic duty and the civic right that you have here in the U.S. So another important piece of information we want to share with everyone is where can you get help? If you have any doubts at all about uh, completing an application, it's very important that you find a qualified organization to help you. As you can imagine, U.S. immigration law is extremely complicated. It seems to change almost every day. It's said that only uh, U.S. tax law is more complicated than immigration law. And for that reason, there's really only two entities who are qualified to provide immigration legal services. Of course, immigration attorneys and representatives from certain agencies that are accredited by the D Department of Justice, which effectively means that the Department of Justice, the U.S. government, has determined that these um, representatives and these agencies have enough training to provide immigration services. So some common, uh, common scams that you might have seen or heard of, uh, and I'm just going to touch upon them very briefly, but one of them is notarios públicos. So unlike in many Spanish-speaking countries, I myself am from one, from Ecuador, in the U.S. a notary public is not a lawyer and is not qualified to provide any legal services related to immigration. So please be careful with that. Small businesses uh, are also uh, places where we've seen issues come up. So there's some businesses that advertise a faster processing time for your application compared to what you what would happen if you worked directly with USCIS or if you worked to work with an attorney or an immigration attorney or a representative. In reality, there are no exceptions to normal US process, USCIS processing times, particularly in relation to citizenship. Lastly, online scams. There are some dot-com websites that want you to pay for immigration forms, but please be, be known, all immigration forms and instructions are available for free at the website uscis.gov. Also, public libraries can help you print out the forms and if you reach out to one of our organizations, we can also assist you in receiving those forms via email or by mail for free. Similarly, there are some scams that contact you by email requesting payment for a guaranteed green card. That is a scam as well, so please be careful. When in doubt, just reach out to an organization or to an immigration attorney and just find out if the information that you've been given is accurate or not. So again, where can you get help? Uh, before filing a case with an attorney, you may want to ask, where did you go to law school? Can I see your current licensee document? Are you a member of the California Bar? Now, for immigration, it doesn't need to be California necessarily, but to be a member of a state bar is important. When opening a case with an organization, you should ask, are you accredited by the Department of Justice? Can I see the order granting that accreditation for that representative? And of course, you can always uh, you can always uh, reach out to the LA Public Library as well, uh, where we are providing uh, services through the New American Center. If you want to make an appointment or you have questions, the library is able to receive messages in English, Spanish, Korean, Chinese, and Persian or Farsi at the phone number on the screen, 213-228-7390. Keep in mind that a library staff member will return your call within two working dates. You can also schedule an appointment yourself by going to www.lapl.org slash new Americans. We just left a couple of images here so you can see uh, where to go. Uh, you'll see the, the front page. And then if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see where that's circled is where you'll press for uh, an appointment. And that's the immigration path. That's the immigration story. That's how you become a citizen. I know we made it look simple, 
um, but know that there's that the, we're here to help. So uh, we want to know if there's any general questions that we can take. Um, I know, like I said, Kim and I are able to answer legal questions. We won't do it live on chat. If you have specific legal questions about your case, you can make an appointment. But we can answer general procedure questions. So I don't know, Maddie, if you have any questions for us as well. Sure, thank you so much for all of that really helpful information and um, for highlighting the library's uh, work in that space as well. Um, we have our Robust New Americans initiative um, where you can call and make appointments um, for those services. And also, um, you know, some of the forms we actually do print out ourselves and they're ready for people to pick up in branches. Um, so I'm looking at my information here. Um, I could say, you know, what would you say is one of the most important parts of the interview um, if I was taking it? Like, what, what, what do you think are, what's most important to review? It's a perfect question for Jonathan, the meanest uh, fake USCIS <laughs> officer in our office. F fake USCIS officer, I'm, just, I'm, I'm one of the <laughs> teachers. Um, I will say, so the entire interview is important. Most definitely the entire interview is more important. But the section that we notice uh, officers do spend a lot of time on and you as the applicant should spend a lot of time on is on the N-400 review. The information on those 20, 21 pages is your life on paper. And the officer is getting to know you by reading that form. So you need to be very, very sure of the information you put in there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of like a memory test a little bit. But that that's probably, I think, the, the section I would say you should spend a little extra time preparing. Then the second one would be speaking, definitely getting comfortable in speaking. The officers are not grading you on how how perfect you are in English. They're grading to make sure, grading, grading you, I should say, to make sure that you understand what's going on and that you can communicate in, in, the, in the English language for your success. I don't know, Kim, is there any other part that you would say? Um, I would mention with the regards to the English section, I always tell clients, we're not looking for Shakespeare here. It's a very basic level of English. Uh, as long as you're able to make yourself understood, uh, that should be, uh, you know, what, what you need. And if you have doubts, always, always take classes. There are free classes available for naturalization. Mm -hmm. uh, our instructors are all great. They work very hard to make sure that you're uh, able and prepared for that interview. Yeah, and thanks for bringing that up because you can uh, also sign up for citizenship classes, which all are online at this time. Um, but you can also do that um, on the library's New Americans uh, landing page on our website. Um, and let's, uh, another question I might have, um, are there special eligibility categories that would allow green card holders to apply before the five-year requirement? Yeah, so we touched on it a little bit in the presentation, but for example, those who are uh, married to U.S. citizens and have been married with uh, that U.S. citizen for more than three years, and that person's been a U.S. citizen for more than three years, uh, they would be eligible to apply uh, for U U.S. citizenship um, at the three-year mark. Uh, we also touched on uh, serving the U.S. Armed Forces. After a year of service with the U.S. Armed Forces, you are also eligible to apply for naturalization as opposed to waiting for the full five years. Now you'll still have to be prepared for the interview, for the history questions, the civics questions mm -hmm. and all that, but you would be able to apply early. Cool, all right, well, thank you for that. And I, and I will just add, there are other immigration categories by which you may have obtained your green card. So I will just, that that's one of those sections where we say ask an attorney, immigration attorney or representative to see if your green card category, if it's a special category, and, and you will know if you if you're in that in that group um, qualifies you to apply sooner than the five year mark. But mm -hmm. it's better to ask. And there are other categories that are eligible for that. All right. Yeah. Always good to ask. Really important. <laughs> ask, ask, ask all the questions. Um, and I think the other question I'm thinking about would be so you, you touched on it in an earlier answer. But what if you're not fluent in English? Um, <laughs> so what if you're not fluent in English? Um, you can, if you're eligible, based on the uh, eligibility criteria mentioned before, able to do your process in your language. 
Now the form will still need to be completed in English. Uh, you may find practice forms in other languages. That's for you to practice. That doesn't mean you can file that form with USCIS. Um, but if you're language exempt, you're able to do it in your native language, USCIS. If they have officers who speak your language, he or she may be the one conducting your interview, at which point you won't require an interpreter. But should the case be that the officer available doesn't speak your language, then we always recommend that you have somebody that can both have command of your native language and English that can act as your interpreter during the interview. Now, this person cannot answer for you. This person is purely just tra uh, transmitting the information from one language to the other and vice versa. Um, we, we have tutoring in specific languages, so we're, we're happy to set up clients if, if we have that language available. But if not, we can also guide you to other resources online provided by USCIS and other organizations across the US that can help you study in your own native language as well. Yeah, and I just want to emphasize the requirements for being language exempt. Um, a lot of people like to say, oh, I have my green card for 16 years, but I'm 45 years old. I'm sorry, that's not enough. You have to have both the age component and the years with the green card. So 15 years and 55 years of age or 20 years with your green card and 50 years of age. It has to add up to 70. That's the easy way to remember. Oh, I like, yeah, that's a good way to remember it. It is something that we've, we're asked fairly frequently here at the library. Um, you know, I have a little post-it in my office to help remind me what the answer is. Um, but I think that um, another side of that question is that when people are waiting to, to hit those numbers, if you will, um, life happens, right? And so that's, that's why it's really important to talk to somebody that even if you have had your green card for a very long time and do have a, a plan and maybe talk to somebody, you know, 15 years ago, um, 20 years ago even, it's really important to revisit those conversations because you want to make sure um, you're still eligible um, in the same way that you might have been before. Um, so you always want to make sure that we're encouraging people who think they may know the information to just double check. And Maddie, I'd add on to that. Um, just because you're not feeling 100% comfortable with or confident in your English levels, again, those citizenship classes are going to be an incredible help. Uh, yeah. It's an excellent space to practice your English, to practice the, the specific English that you need for the interview and the test. Um, I, I can't plug those classes enough. Those are, those are just an amazing resource for anyone wanting to become a U.S. citizen. And I will also add that if we find that you may not be quite there with your English, we will connect you with ESL classes, either provided by the library or provided by IRC, another organization, because we still want you to get ready for that interview, no matter what. Um, and I can tell you, IRC has a 100% pass rate. All our students pass their interview when they take the class and study and prepare at home for the test. So um, along with IRC, there are other organizations in LA that can help you get ready for this. So definitely take advantage of the free classes across the city. We're doing them virtually. Hopefully we'll get to them in person um, by the fall, fingers crossed. Uh, but we really are, are, are able to assist you from A to Z, from beginning to end and with your educational needs. And we can even provide you with an assessment to make sure that your English is at at a level that will make you feel comfortable. And we will find you with additional resources as well to make sure that you get there. Yes, thank you for bringing up, you know, the library also has a strong adult literacy program that is, um, if you have, uh, I believe it's the second or third grade level uh, English, they're able to work with you really directly to help you improve your English skills. Um, so that's, that's one of the uh, programs that you're probably referring people to here all the time. Um, well, I don't have any other questions today, so I didn't know if there's other uh, information that you'd like to add. Well, we'll just say that um, be patient with immigration and any immigration process. Be patient with naturalization, especially. It, it's the final step for anybody with a green card to get to get that citizenship certificate. So be patient with the process. Um, be honest and truthful with your representative and your attorney if they're assisting you. The more information that we have when filling out your forms, the better informed we can be about your case and give you the proper advice to mm -hmm. make sure they have a successful interview. So honesty, honesty is one of the top things that we, that we always ask for and want from our clients. 
And just know that the, it's confidential. The conversations you have with us, the consultations, all that information is confidential and we don't share with anybody. So even though you may be assisted through the Los Angeles Public Library, the information, the conversation you have with myself, with Kim, with our other partners, they're confidential. And we're here to protect you and help you get to, to U.S. citizenship. So that's our top priority. And we want to make sure you do it um, smartly, safely, as informed as possible, and with all the tools that you can get. Yeah, and I would also add to that, you know, we're doing this because we want to do this. We want to be of help to immigrants who want to achieve naturalization and, you know, any other immigration service that they need. Um, through the LA Public Library, we're able to provide these services uh, without cost to our clients. So that is uh, one of the benefits that we're able to do through this partnership. And again, just to reiterate, we're here because we want to be here. We, if we're asking for certain documents, it's because there's a reason for it. We're not just trying to create a hurdle for you or to create some obstacle for you, for you to, to do it. It's really more of taking precautions and making sure that we're presenting your case in the best way possible. And like Jonathan said, uh, it takes time. Uh, it requires patience. And we know many of you have been waiting a long time just to get to this point, but immigration is slow uh, sometimes. And sometimes we just need to remember that it's putting one foot in front of the other and taking the steps necessary to, to get to where you want to go. For sure, thank you so much. Um, okay, so I think that this concludes our presentation today. Thank you very much, IRC, for coming and sharing all of this information. Um, with our library patrons as part of the Big Read program. And I am going to close this out here. Um, again, thanks for joining. Don't forget to check out our next NEA Big Read program by visiting lapl.org backslash big hyphen read. The next program is tomorrow at 1 p.m. You can come listen to Cynthia Tai talk about her experiences as a second generation Vietnamese American singing and Vietnamese and her family's experiences in publishing Saigon Times and the creation of the Boat People Memorial. You can see it here live on our YouTube channel. And again, here's a link to our survey for your chance to win a copy of The Best We Could Do and a gift card for $50 at the library store. Your entry must be in by Wednesday of this coming week. Until next time, we truly appreciate all of your support. The success of all of our library programs could not happen without viewers like you. So thank you. Have a great day.